I can tell you, I can speak for the whole panel to say we're really thrilled to be here. This has been so much fun. You are an unbelievably inspiring, brave group, and it's just a great privilege to be here. It's also a great privilege to be here with this panel. Um, we have an absolutely wonderful panel. Uh, Jamie Lerner is a, is a lifelong hero of mine, um, the uh, incredible mayor of Curitiba who made it probably the most interesting, innovative city in the world. Um, I discovered that Sanjan and Wanjira actually have all kinds of funny ties. Sanjan's parents were doing refugee work in Africa and lived in the compound that Wanjira now lives in. And they both think Montana looks like the African belt. Um, and Danell is was you just a couple years ago. So he will be sort of your, your bridge to this panel and how you actually get from where you're sitting now to the incredible accomplishments that this panel has achieved. And we're gonna start by kind of just laying out, we, we, the other thing that's gonna make this panel really amazing is that we are talking about the most consequential topic on earth. Um, as Wanjira said to me earlier, energy is at the heart of everything. It underlies everything you care about. If you wanna be able to provide people with Food and water, it requires energy. If you want medicine and health care, it requires energy. Shelter, mobility, education, all of the things that you are committed to working on, energy is, it is necessary to power it. Um, and yet, much of the world still lacks that critical, lacks access to electricity or to clean fuels. So we're gonna start by just kind of laying out the, those issues. And I'm gonna ask Wanjira, to tell you about what it means to live in a part of the world that doesn't have access to energy. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you, everybody. This is way <clears throat> too much fun. I am uh, often at the annual meeting in New York, and I'll tell you, if, if anybody has anything to do with it, I'll be back here <laughs> in the CGIU. Thank you so much, and really, it is the truth. Energy is the heart of everything. If you really care about poverty, education, environment, climate change, nothing brings those together more than energy. And the lack of energy in so many countries paralyzes development. And I'll give you the example of Kenya, where I'm from. And I know there are some Kenyans in the audience. Ken yeah, <laughs> shout out, Kenyans. <laughs> Kenya is a country that relies on electricity and just like the United States, depends on it for development. But you'll be surprised that only 30% of Kenyans have access to electricity. Only 30% can light their night with electricity. What do the others use? We have a 14% penetration of solar energy. That leaves 56% of people who use kerosene, batteries, or candles for lighting. Let's talk about cooking, something that people do every day. 90% of rural Kenyans, these are Kenyans who live in a rural setting, cook on open fires using firewood or other biomass. If we count charcoal, which is considered a little bit more processed biomass, that number goes up or down to about 80%. So let's just say almost every Kenyan cooks on open fires. The dangers to the health alone, the public health implications of cooking, cooking on open fires is well known. I don't know how many of you know that four million people die every year from complications of indoor air pollution. In Kenya alone, that number is 15,000. That cooking kills is unacceptable. And that, I think, is one of the most fundamental things that we have to address. But it's also critical because nothing drives development more than energy. Kenya's energy future is really dependent, fortunately, on a more renewable energy source. Kenya is one of the countries that has an extremely high potential for geothermal energy, and that is the priority for our country. But I must say that solar energy is probably more promising, but as I said, 14%. So the opportunity to transform communities using renewable energy is incredible. 
There are business opportunities, but there are also opportunities for entrepreneurs at the grassroots level. Thank you. So Sanjan, Wanjira has given a really wonderful description of what energy, the implications for humans from energy. Can you talk about the implications of energy production for the rest of life on Earth and for our atmosphere? And I know you can draw on an amazing, um, one of the many amazing television series that we all know you from, um, in this case one that took you all over the world to look at, at both the direct impacts of energy production on ecosystems and also, of course, the indirect through climate change. Sure. Um, great to be here, by the way. And, you know, I echo what one Jira says. You know, if you go to the annual meeting in New York, it is a great thing, and I don't want to knock that <laughs> annual meeting, otherwise they're, they're going to stop inviting me. But this is where the energy is. I mean, I absolutely can see. I can't believe I've been missing this all, all, the, all these years. So I'm going to be back to CGIU. Um, when you think about energy, you know, you're going to hear a theme that's going to come up from this whole panel over and over again, and that is it really is everything. So whether you're into education or you're into saving wildlife and wildlife habitats like I am, or into healthcare or you're into poverty alleviation you, or education, you trace that back and you will end up with this challenge that you have to face. You know, how do you provide clean, accessible energy to everyone on an equitable basis without bankrupting the future of this planet in the process, i.e. changing our atmosphere um, in the process of doing it, creating all these unforeseen um, consequences of what it means to burn you know, charcoal in a kitchen. My grandmother, I mean, I was telling one jury in the back, my grandmother died of emphysema because the kitchen that she lived and worked in did not have a window. Can you believe that? A kitchen that didn't have a window. And that's the way it used to be in Sri Lanka back in the day. And that's what killed her. Um, so when you think about all the other life on Earth, the non-human life on Earth that's still important to us, I was just recently in Tanzania with Jane Goodall. You all know who Jane Goodall is, amazing woman. And you know, she was in Gombe, which is the place where she began her work on chimpanzees. And what's happened to this place that she studied for 50 years has become completely isolated. The chimpanzees in Gombe can no longer really you know, cross to other chimpanzee populations. And slowly, that population at Gombe is shrinking. It's inbreeding, it's dying out. The reason is because everything outside of the park has been cut down, primarily because people need the wood there as a very poor energy source. It's also farming, but the chopping of trees, small pieces of wood, is really what has created that havoc. Now you think, okay, well that's long, long way away in Tanzania. That kind of thing really won't affect us here in the US. You're wrong. I just did a trip last year where I went from the, on the Colorado River, from Glen Canyon Dam, which is the giant dam that produces all this hydropower and water for much of the West, all the way down to follow the trace of the Colorado River, cross the border, the Morales Dam, into Mexico. And this river basically doesn't flow to the sea. It hasn't flown to the sea since about the mid-1990s. The Colorado River. Now, this is a gigantic, massive river when you're in the Grand Canyon, right? I mean, I, I was afraid of this river and being on it in the Grand Canyon. By the time it gets into Mexico, it is so small that I could stop it, literally stop it with my foot, right? It's a trickle of water. And it, then it dies out. It dies out about 100 miles from the, from the sea. And you ask, why does that happen? It happens because, because we have cheap energy that allows us to grow things like lettuce in the winter to feed America. So if you had lettuce for lunch, maybe not in Florida, but certainly where I am, in most of America, if you're eating lettuce in the winter or green vegetables in the winter, you're basically eating the Colorado River, subsidized by extraordinarily cheap energy. That's why you're getting to do it. And you didn't even know that was the choice you're making. So energy is everything. It has huge impacts on wildlife and on the, the future of the planet on Earth. But I think there's a future and there's a hopeful future to it. And we'll get to that. But the key to that is that energy is no longer centralized. It's now become also decentralized. And that's what allows all of you to play in this sector. So Jamie, the... Um I'd like to carry on this theme of everything connected to everything because you have really seen how this plays out in a, in a major city 
and a city that you have, have transformed over several decades and that you've really made the point that energy is embedded in a web of all kinds of relationships and, and that 70% of the world is headed toward living in cities very soon, so that cities play this absolutely critical role. So how in the urban setting do you see energy fitting into this web of sus sustainability? Thank you. Uh, one of the major sources of energy is waste. So cities are the biggest consumers of energy. Uh, as you said, 75% 70, of carbon emissions are related to the cities. It's on the concept of the cities that we can move towards a more sustainable and a better quality of life of city life. But how could be a good concept of the city? So I would like to propose a metaphor. My metaphor of the city is the turtle. So because the city is living, working, moving, uh, having leisure, everything together. And the sh at the same time, the shell of the turtle looks like an urban tessiture. So we can imagine it will cut the shell of the turtle, living here, working there, having leisure there, the turtle is going to die. That's exactly what's happening in many cities in the world. When the people are living here, working there, the amount of waste of energy, waste of quality of life, waste of time, because the misconception of the cities. And it's not difficult. If you want to have a more sustainable city, just two simple rules. Use your car less and live closer to work or bring work closer to home. But speaking about the car, <laughs> I have another example. <clears throat> The car is the cigarette of the future. <laughs> Let's hope that that's really true. Uh, because I'm not saying you won't have a car, of course. You, won't, you still have your cars. Uh, the car producers, they, they'll pro, they provide jobs. But it's the way you use your car. So, of, of course, for trips, for leisure, but in the daily routine itinerary, you have to work with a good public transport. So, it's not having, it's not, it's not, not having a car, it's the way you use. And mostly, our cities are so dependent on cars, and there is no way to have a good city just depending on the cars. So we have to provide better alternatives. And still, as you said, still it's energy, saving energy. Because we, we can have a lot of good solutions on, on public transportation, on routine itineraries the daily routine itineraries. So that's why now I'm working. Okay, wait, it, Jamie, before I let you talk about what okay. you're working next, we're gonna come back to that, but first okay. I wanna go backwards in everyone's okay. life um, and, and find out where you guys all got started because everyone out in this audience is at an important, crucial juncture in their own life. They're really getting started. It's a very daunting place to be. And Donnell will look familiar to you because he was here just two years ago as a CGIU commitment maker, and he is now the CEO of a startup and so really has been 
through this journey that you are all embarking on now. And so I'd like you to tell us about how you came to be involved in the work that you're in and how that turned into a company. Absolutely. Um, I'm so ex excited and thrilled to be here. I, just two years ago, I was in the audience, and I'm really nervous. If I make any mistakes, be, be kind. Um, uh, I, I, I grew up in a low-income community in central Brooklyn. If you go to central Brooklyn now, it's been gentrified, and there's restaurants and dog parks and bicycle lanes, and that's awesome. It's better for energy in cities. Uh, when I grew up, it was a slum. There was open-air drug markets. Um, I picked my sister up from the babysitter one day and watched one 16-year-old shoot another one in the head. Um, and, 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 you know, m m many of you come from places where you learn pretty early on that life can be really chaotic, right, and really unfair. Um, I, you know, was fortunate to have parents who were really focused on education, and so I was really well educated. I went to Duke. We got the, we got the Duke banner up there in the back. <laughs> Hopefully we got another national championship coming this year. Any Blue Devils? Um, <laughs> But, but when I graduated, I, I, you know, I'd spent time in college learning about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and in, in, in 19, 20-year-old, 22-year-old uh, African-Americans' ability to use nonviolent direct action to destroy the Jim Crow system of segregation in the South. And you, you study the history and you meet one or two of these folks and, 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 and see that they literally changed the world when they were 22. And it creates all this pressure, right? Because... You know, I'm, you know, you're 22 and you're looking in the mirror saying there's a problem that I want to solve and there's something, and, and, and all of you are here be, be, because you have that, that drive and that ability and you've been selected to be here. I think, I think in getting from, from that passion and that focus um, that, that brings you here today to being, to being able to, to, to launch and start an organization that will survive and will thrive and uh, begin to hire people and raise money and, and, and begin to address some of the problems that all of you want to solve, the, 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 the one or two lessons that I'll quickly share with 30 seconds is um, when you guys leave the university, adults are going to be incredibly dismissive of you. And um, for most of your lives, you have your parents, you have your schools, and you've been in institutions that are focused on helping you develop. And when you leave university, that's not going to be the case. Um, the, the adults have a system that's entrenched, and they're not going to want to budge. They, they believe in doing things the way that they've been done, and for the most part, um, even, in, even folks who want to help you, and you learn this as some of you who go to CGI, um, don't really have a plan or a set of solutions as to how to solve the climate crisis or other crises that you guys are focused on. And so you really want to give yourself permission to, to experiment and act and learn in a really thoughtful, deliberate manner. Um, and and to, second, you, you, you need to think about establishing credibility for yourselves uh, for your organizations, the ability to persuade your parents, hey, no, I don't want to go to medical school or business school right now. I actually want to work on this issue that I care about, right? Um, that's an incredibly important conversation. The, the, it's, it's not just going to be about passion. It's going to be like, hey, mom, hey, dad, I know we have student loans. I know we have this. My parents were immigrants. They moved to this country and started from scratch. I know what it's like to, to look someone in the face who has lots of hopes and dreams for you and, and say, no, I, I want to move back to this terrible slum that I grew up in for half of the salary uh, to, to, to help people. But, but these are the sorts of decisions that you guys are going to be faced with. And um, I think um, you know, the, the, the co combining the courage and passion that you all have already demonstrated with a real thoughtfulness of what it's going to take in terms of resources, in terms of staff, convincing people to work for you, persuading investors to invest in you, those are the sorts of skills that you need to be developing as you're finishing your, your time at university and moving off into the, into the real world. I hope that's helpful. That's, that's wonderful. And we'll come back to, in a little while to where you're headed now and some of the obstacles that you're overcoming. But Wanjira, I'd like you to talk about there are kind of two critical turning points in your life because there's your mother's critical turning point that shaped your childhood, and then there's your own recognition of the centrality of energy. So maybe you could talk a little about both of those. Yeah, I would say for me there, there are two things really. There's uh, the fact that I was the beneficiary of great mentors and great opportunities to experience and to learn to care. And that's something that I think we nurture and we develop over time. But how important it is that we develop that gut feeling that makes you uncomfortable. Because you may not know what the issue will be, but I just remember always feeling an empathy 
with certain situations. And I think I would say that's one thing where you're fortunate to have CGIU, I'll say, because you have an opportunity to interact with people, to interact with situations different, and to sharpen that sense, that consciousness. That is something that I think will be a big part, and certainly was a big part for me. And that intersected with the fact that in 2004, my mother won the Nobel Peace Prize. And when she won that prize, we had no idea what that meant. A phone call comes at 12.30 sharp, and it tells you that you have won the Nobel Peace Prize. And that phone call informs you and informs the world at the same time. I was at that time fortunately working very closely with my mother, and she turned to me and she said, well, now you will be the International Affairs Department. <laughs> and so I started working, supporting her, <clears throat> and ensuring that the message of the interconnectedness of environment, democracy, and peace were, was a, a platform that I facilitated her ability to share. And it was in the process of working with her and doing the work that she was doing that I started to feel that this issue of energy and environment surely is so transformative. It is the only issue that I know that touches on so many things at the same time. That if I were to provide opportunities for women to cook safely, that transforms their public health. I was a public health practitioner, so that was on top of my list. That energy availability and the provision of affordable energy also brought down the cost of doing business. That was incredible for entrepreneurs. That the amount of pollution that goes into the air from indoor air pollution from cooking in those killing chambers was also incredibly terrible for our climate. So there was climate change. I knew of no other issue. And immediately, I just gravitated to that. I was fortunate to have been in the right place at the right time. And I always, and I agree with people who say there is no such thing as luck. You're in a certain place, you're well prepared, you take advantage of situations. And in January of 2013, then Secretary Clinton launched the W Power Project. This was a project that would bring uh, renewable energy solutions to grassroots women who, these are the 90% who cook on open fires. And here I was being asked to lead and direct an initiative that would bring renewable energy solutions to these 90%, I jumped on it. It was an incredible opportunity because I know if we can transform those 90%, then we can transform our country. And the same can happen across our continent, really across Sub-Sahara and across the developing world. That number of people who require energy is so high that it will make the difference. And so for me, I found myself literally given what I considered the perfect opportunity. And it was because of the preparation, yes, because of the exposure, but I think it also was because of what I believe you're developing now, which is that sense of consciousness and that sense of caring. Sanjay, what would you say was a really pivotal early moment for you in terms of... <laughs> I, I fooled my family into, like, <laughs> pretending I was going to medical school. If you're, if you're South Asian, you're pretty much, you know, doctor, engineer, lawyer, or they don't even want to talk to you, right? And so for years, I grew up in Africa, and, and I, for years I just sort of played this game because I had no idea. Look, I'll tell you one thing, right? When I was, like, the age of most of the people in this audience, I had no clue what I actually wanted to do. And it's okay not to know. And it's okay not to like have it all worked out and planned out because guess what, it's gonna change. Um, and don't be intimidated by the fact that you know, everyone's giving a TEDx talk and you know, it, it's just like, it's okay. You'll get there on your own way. All you have to do is really care about something. So eventually when I got my PhD, I go back to Sri Lanka and I overhear my grandmother talking to a neighbor across the wall and she goes, my grandson is back, he's a doctor now, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> she actually had to add that in. <laughs> but, but you... <laughs> so formative mo that was a formative moment in life. And I asked myself, is that really true? And actually, to be honest, to be honest with you, I've spent the last 15 years of my life 
first at the Nature Conservancy, now with Conservation International, trying to prove her wrong. I truly believe, just as what you said, the shell of the turtle is that great analogy. It's all connected. At the core of it sits energy, but the way in which you're going to impact the world, it really is all connected. The work I do really does actually impact people. Very real, and I've seen that myself. Um, I will say one thing, because we're talking about energy just for, for this audience. You know, the great thing about energy is that when I was in my 20s, there was no way I could even imagine having the voice or the ability to play in this sector. I mean, think about what, when you thought about energy back then, you thought about a giant coal-fired plant, or you thought about a nuclear power plant that they're going to build. What, what, what was I, I going to do? I mean, I could become an engineer or something and work there. But in terms of actually changing a trajectory, no way. The amazing thing is the decentralization is happening with technology, and it's happening faster than ever. Look, basically, if you take that much land, that much, like they one can. square, yeah, a little yes. bit more than one square <laughs> meter, you get enough energy from the sun to power a 100-watt light bulb. And now we have the power to start tapping into that. And we're still not very good at that. Even the best technology we have that taps into it, what are they getting? 10, 11, 12, 14, 15% efficiency? There's a huge room to grow. So what you can go out right now at a sale at Radio Shack and buy that stuff, you can genuinely create energy. You could become a player in this, in this field. And I think that is really, really exciting. Thank you. So, so Jaime, when, when Jaime was starting out as the mayor of Curitiba, one of the first things he did is virtually overnight, I guess you'd call it a flash mob now, he went out and turned the downtown into a pedestrian area. And he got worried that they were going to drive cars, that there were a group of, of drivers who were going to protest by driving cars through it. So his chosen weapon was a bunch of kids, little kids that he brought in with paper and paints to sit on the ground and paint so to keep the drivers out, uh, which was a, a brilliant way to wage war, I think. The, um, when you were starting out in Curitiba, you became famous for two precepts. One is the more zeros you remove, the more creative you get. So the less money you have, the more you have to fill in with creativity. And that there are lots, this, this follows on what Sanjan said, there are lots of complexity sellers out there. Things should be simple and we should beat the complexity sellers with a slipper. So, <laughs> so can you think back to those days and how you got yourself to be mayor in the first place and how you came up with these incredible ideas that, that also involved, please talk about the, the work you did to get waste collected too, which was okay. amazing. So I was very lucky on living in the street. It was, my parents they were Jewish immigrants. They, they had a small shop in the, in the important street. And that street, we had everything. The railroad station, the trolley station, the city council, the radio stations, newspapers, uh, and, and many others, uh, uh, industries, everything. So I grew up, I grew up uh, knowing from the people from the countryside, well, we, all they, their problems or from the workers, from the industries, or from the politicians, from the city council, I was listening all the time. It was my course of reality. At the same time, close to my house, there was a circus. I went to the, they stopped, they parked there for 10 years. I went every night to the circus. I knew every, I know everything about circus. <laughs> you know, a circus is moved by a Roomba. If you don't play a Roomba, the acrobat will fall down. So, I'm speaking that knowing what the people, uh, I, 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 for me, the, the street was everything. The street 
the street is the is the is the city. The city is the society. Everything is related to the it was related to, to the street where I lived. So knowing that it helped me a lot when I was a mayor. So how to uh, how to manage, and I realized one thing, we cannot have all the answers. We don't, we are not so, we cannot be so prepotent, so arrogant and having all the answers. It's important to start. Innovation is starting. That's why how we started with the solution of public transport, we started in 74, it was the first time in the world. Now there are three, more than 300 cities implementing the same or sim, similar, similar solutions. Well, what I, I realize is really, it's better to make changes when you deal with people. That's why it's so difficult on having commitments of countries on reducing uh, carbon emissions because every country has a different problem, political problem. But at the city level, the city is the last refuge of solidarity. It's on the cities that you can make the difference. Every citizen. I remember when we tried to teach the children how to separate the garbage. We teach every child in every school, all of them, during six months how to separate garbage. It was in 1989. And the children, after the children, they teach their parents. And now we started the whole program. And now it's the city that has the highest rate of separation of garbage in the world. 60 or 70% of people are separating their garbage. So, oh, that's why I'm obsessed about the idea how to teach children about their own city. Because if they understand their city, they'll respect it more. You will have more commitments. And speaking about commitments, it's hard to have commitments of countries, but at the city level, it's not difficult because you're dealing with people. So that's why I'm working in a smartwatch. This smartwatch is the relationship with what you save and what you waste in water and what you waste and what you save in energy. So every citizen could control in his household or his neighborhood or his city. So, and due to a similar proposal, we can have more commitments with people with reducing the use of water and with reducing the use of energy. So I, I realize one thing, just to, to finish. It's hard, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My grandchildren, they drive me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll stop. No, I just wanted to say that you, <laughs> Javi is such a wonderful panelist that he asked the first Twitter, the first question that was tweeted in without me even having to repeat it, which was, how can we create a culture of energy conservation instead of our current culture of waste and overuse? So a smart watch, the, the, I, I, you heard about some of this in the big data session this morning, beginning to actually give people real-time information about what they're using and what the environmental impact of what they're using uh, in terms of carbon emissions or in terms of water waste is can really have an impact. Um, I want to, because our time is running short, I do want to be sure that we talk about what you all can do in this world and sort of 
where the panelists see the kind of next stage moving. Um, I'll go, Danelle, I'm going to come back to you in a minute to answer this question about finding this really nuts and bolts questions about partners and investors. But Wanjiro, I want to come back to you for a minute because Sanjin touched on what to me is the most exciting thing happening in energy, which is this ability to work with a distributed system rather than a centralized system, which makes everyone a potential market participant. You can, you can participate by producing supply in your backyard, whether it's, it's generally from a solar system. You can also participate by, by producing demand, what's called megawatts. You can start taking off demand when renewable energy isn't available and, and have your house and your smart appliances start to follow the availability of renewable supply. And the really critical uh, thing that has to happen to make that possible is what people sometimes refer to as the internet of electricity or the smart grid, where you take these distributed systems and you start networking them. And then in a place like Africa, that gives you a, an opportunity to build an energy system, not from the top down with giant power plants and power lines and power companies, but from the bottom up. Do you see that happening? Do you see that as an opportunity in Africa? Absolutely. I think you need both of them. I mean, I think cities especially have a great responsibility to make the right choices in waste, in energy, and certainly the national governments as well. But when it comes to adoption, penetration, distribution, and production, it's extremely important. There are some great examples out there. The project that I direct is looking at engaging women, illiterate women most of the time, as what we call energy entrepreneurs. These are women who we train and build their capacity to understand the importance of this energy, use it, but also produce and sell it. So we have women training to become energy entrepreneurs in East Africa, Nigeria, and India. And these are women we are looking, for example, in the next two years to reach 3.5 million women with clean energy access. The issue is clean energy access. There's availability is sometimes there, but we need to scale up the distribution and the production, and we need to do that from both ends. There's also the, many of you may know the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, really one of the most successful private-public partnerships that is working with over a thousand partners to both raise awareness about the importance of clean cooking and clean fuels, scale up production and distribution, but also look at the opportunities for enhancing efficiency in clean energy. I also cannot give more credence to the potential for solar energy to transform. Solar energy is in, in at least in Africa where we live in the solar belt. We have no excuse. Kenya is, for example, the beneficiary of some incredible innovations in mobile technology. Many of you may know M-Pesa. We transfer money for all sorts of things. I pay all my bills, I can do that sitting here and pay every single bill through my telephone. We also seeing innovations from very young entrepreneurs and how we can buy service on a daily basis. So can families who don't have a lot of money pay for solar access technology to electricity, so that they do that through their mobile phones for a daily use of energy. These are innovations that are completely transforming the lives of children who can now read using light that is good for them, women who now have more time to, to tend to their families instead of fetching firewood, but also an incredible innovation that is in the clean cooking technologies where women can now have Stoves, check this out, stoves that both charge the phone, cook your food, and light. This is the future. You, this panel is called the future of energy. The energy is the future. Thank you. Thank you. So, Danelle, though, you can see the Twitter feed lining up yes. with questions of tell us what I to do answer, next. I will so. answer all three questions yes. in two minutes. Okay. So, so one question is, how did you find partners and investors for your startup? Another question was for Dr. Sanjay, and how do we influence the massive political structure supporting, you know, polluting power plants? And, and then last, how can millennials unite in their goals to produce positive change in the energy sector all in two minutes? Okay. So, so uh, to, to go back to the, the way that technology is changing and cook stoves and computers, the smartwatch, um, the cost of solar panels is coming down, has dropped dramatically. 
uh, the cost of launching a new uh, software-based startup is coming down because of what Amazon's doing. So, so technology is cheaper on the hardware side. The, the cost of computing is really cheap. It's really easy for millennials to use all of your technical savvy with social networking, uh, the ability to design programs and run experiments to deploy hardware, solar panels, clean energy systems, solar hot water uh, in, in, in your own communities. In fact, that's what our startup does. Um, we at Block Power, we uh, crowdsource. You guys know Kickstarter. We're like a Kickstarter for clean energy in your neighborhood. And so you may go to a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a community center that cannot afford to finance solar panels on its roof, but you can lead and crowdsource a campaign where, where local folks can invest in installing solar on that community. And what we think is going to happen is that you, 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 will, you will start to establish already existing social relationships that you have and move people into the climate change fight, which can then influence mm -hmm. policy. And so we, we, we think that utilization of big data, the collapsing cost of technology, software, is one of the ways that millennials can really have an impact uh, in terms of actually installing clean energy in your local neighborhoods, reducing carbon emissions, which, which will then influence policy. Well, he did that in a minute and a half. That's what CGIU does for you. <laughs> Okay, so we have 20 seconds left. Jaime, I, in, I interrupted what was, I know was gonna be a brilliant closing remark, no. so. <laughs> no, I have the luck of having a course of reality and fantasy. And I realized one thing, how important are dreams. Because when you don't have a dream, there's no way how to make it happen. So I realized one thing. Sometimes when you have a dream and you cannot make it happen, I should say, don't be frustrated. Uh, be sure, be sure that if you dedicate yourself to your dream, one day this dream goes around you and will hit you and will say, you remember me, I'm your dream. It's, it's your second chance, don't lose it. Thank you very much all of you for a wonderful, inspiring panel.